Dr. Jean Reisman. I like to collect Southern stories, and one of my favorites is a story about what happened at Mount Zion Baptist Church, high up in the mountains of North Georgia. It's homecoming, homecoming Sunday, and everybody who's ever lived in the neighborhood has been invited to come for the service. The ladies have been preparing their picnic baskets with fried chicken and corn on the cob and banana pudding and everything that could possibly be made from jello. <laughs> They've invited a young preacher who once lived in the neighborhood to give the morning sermon. He does the best he can. When he finishes, the ladies are spreading the tables. Very strange looking man comes up to him, looks him straight in the eye. That was one boring sermon. <laughs> Goes off. Comes back a second time. I didn't think it would ever end. <laughs> Returns a third time. You know, we've had some terrible speakers at this church. <laughs> You're the worst. Pastor of the church comes up to him, says, don't pay any attention to him. He's a little bit feeble-minded, can't think for himself. Just goes around repeating what everybody else is saying. <laughs> and that's what I do. I go around repeating what other people have told me. Fortunately, some of them have told me life-changing truths. Let me tell you how that happened. I was a, a professor. I was head of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Auburn University. Had a chance to do television. That program that I did won an award. I thought this might work on commercial television. So I brought the concept up to Ted Turner's people. They liked it. And as a result for over a decade, 12 years, I did television specials, and I hosted a show called Up Close, and I interviewed celebrities. And uh, it began to strike me as a surprise that whether I was talking to Ronald Reagan or Ray Charles, whether I was talking to Mary Kay or Tennessee Williams, whether I was talking to Jack Nicholas or Aaron Copeland, when I asked them, what makes you successful? They answered it the same way. I thought, this is strange. These people do different things. They have very different personalities, and yet they are answering the question the same way. And gradually it dawned on me that success has its own rules, regardless of what you do. And so I set out to find out what those rules are that make people successful. I began to write down the answer. Eventually wrote a book called The Achievement Factors that received a lot of favorable attention. Began to do speeches on that subject. I identified in that book nine themes that show up again and again in very successful careers. Nine themes. Now, I've got several hours of material on those themes. In fact, I asked Patrick before I got up here this morning, I, I said, I've got so much material. How long can I take? He said, oh, take as long as you want. But we're going to leave in about 30 minutes. <laughs> so let me just pick three of those and focus on them to see if there's anything you can glean from it that will help you in your career and what you do. One of the themes that showed up again and again, in fact, here they are, competence, time management, and focus slash concentration. So let me talk about each of those very briefly. The first is 
competence. What is competence? Competence is knowing. Competence is showing. Competence is an attitude. Competence is a habit. Competence is knowing. I was sitting listening to Nobel laureate Herbert Simon, and he began to describe some studies that he had done with chess players. And he said, I think competence in any difficult field is patterns stored in memory. He said, a grandmaster chess player can recognize from 15,000 to 50,000 different patterns on a board. He stored that many patterns in memory. He said, we also found that it takes about 10 years for a chess player to move from their first lesson, their first experience, to grandmaster. Bobby Fischer, 9.6 years. Later on, Edith Polgar, I read that she had become a grandmaster when she was 15. I read the New York Times article about her, and I'm thinking, I wonder if that 10-year pattern holds. And then I read Edith Polgar played her first chess game when she was five years old. Patterns stored in memory. He, in later correspondence that I did with him, he told me that he had found the same thing to hold for neurosurgeons or classical pianists. So if it's a difficult field, it becomes patterns stored in memory. Or, for example, if you're handling the books or if you're marketing or you're selling, you're determining, you're finding out how I can do that better. It's deep knowledge. So competence is knowing. Competence is showing. Pericles says, he who cannot communicate his ideas stands at the same level as he who has no ideas. Think about that for a minute. What does it matter if your company delivers the best products, gives the best service anywhere if people don't know it? Competence is telling. Competence is an attitude. I'm sitting in the uh, office of Charles Schultz. By the way, his office was located at one Snoopy Lane, Santa Rosa, California. And he says to me, don't wait till you become famous to start drawing great comic strips. Draw the best comic strip you're capable of drawing today. You see, sometimes I see somebody when I'm uh, purchasing something and they're in a grumpy mood and they don't give me good customer service and I think, oh, they're just waiting till they become famous to start doing that, I see. <laughs> it's, it's an attitude. I asked Sean, before I came up here this morning, what is one thing that you would like for this audience to take away this morning? And he said, what I would like for them to take away is this. Your attitude determines your success in life. Your attitude. It is an attitude. And then there's another, another point that I'd like to make, and that is uh, that your attitude eventually becomes a habit. You do it long enough, and it becomes a habit. So attitude becomes a habit. Have you ever had to deal with somebody and you gave them something to do or asked them to do a task and you just knew that it was going to come back done right and on time? Ever happened to you? I'm sure it has. And have you ever had dealt with somebody and you asked them to do something, you delegated a task and you knew it almost certainly was going to come back late and done wrong? All right. It all started with an attitude that became a habit. Well, those are some of those points that have to do with competence. Now, the second point I'd like to make is time management. 
I found out that whenever I interviewed very successful people, they were very, they were very conscious of how they spent their time. For example, Benjamin Franklin, who unfortunately died before I could interview him. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin said, do not squander time, for time is the stuff life is made of. When I wrote Time Tactics of Very Successful People, I decided that I would emphasize how much time is worth. And so I put a chart in the book about how much your time is worth. For example, if you make $40,000 a year and you work a 40-hour week, I know many of you work many more than 40 hours. Each minute is worth about 35.4 cents. And if you can figure out how to save one hour a day, at that ratio, it comes to $5,000 a year. One hour a day. So if you can find out how to be more efficient with your time, one hour a day becomes $5,000 a year. If you make $100,000 a year, that, comes, that turns out to be about 85.4 cents. And here's where it's interesting. Figure out how to save an hour a day. That becomes $12,225 a year. Pretty impressive, huh? If you can find out how to save a minute here, a minute there. The interviewing Stanley Marcus, as in Neiman Marcus, the chairman, and he puts it this way. I pay lots of attention to the clock in some parts of my life so that I can pay absolutely no attention to the clock in other parts of my life. Like when I'm at a concert, when I'm watching a sunset, or when I'm spending time with my grandson, paying lots of attention. Now, I have prepared a list of 21 of my favorite time savers, and I prepared it just for you. And here's how I'd like for you to get it. If you'll get out your smartphone, your iPhone, your Android, and you'll type in this email address. Give you a chance to do that because I'm going to tell you how to use your iPhone or your Android, your smartphone to get more out of every day. I'm going to give you about five or six tips that you can use it in a very constructive way. Here's the address I'd like for you to type in. Type in Abe, A-B-E, at mindspring.com, M-I-N-D-S-P-R-I-N-G, mindspring.com. And put on the subject line, time. And if you'll send that to me, we'll send you a link that will give you 21 time savers. And besides that, we'll also give you the latest edition of the Achievement Digest that has lots and lots of tips on how to be a better leader, how to be a better salesperson. But don't send it quite yet. <laughs> you already sent it, some of you, I'll bet. Um, you can do it again, because at the end of this session, I'd love for you to tell me which of the tips or which of the ideas you liked best and is there anything you wish that I'd talked about that we didn't get to? I'd love for you to do that. So you can, and if there's anything you would like to have me explain, you can ask me in that email because I want you to consider me a resource that you can draw upon. J.B. Fuqua. J.B. Fuqua. If you go to Duke University, the name of the business school is called the Fuqua School of Business. J.B. Fuqua, if you go to the Botanical Gardens, he helped give most of the money 
for the botanical gardens. J.B. Fuqua said this to me. He said, I think they should show how to use the phone in business school. Well, I thought, how much time does it take to learn how to use a phone? I did subsequent interviews with him for USA Today and mentioned him in my book. Here's what he said, and here's the first tip. He said, I script myself for every important phone call. I said, well, what do you put on your script? He said, first of all, I put on my script what I want to get out of that phone call. In other words, when I hang up, what do I expect to have happened? What is my goal? Then I, want, I put down bullet points of everything I want to cover. Have you ever made a phone call to somebody who was hard to get, and when you hung up, you thought, oh, I forgot to mention this. You have to try again to get that person. He said, I have the bullet points. Next, he said, I anticipate everything that a person is going to ask me or anything I want to present, and then I write down on that script how I'm going to respond or how I'm going to say it. Little power phrases. And he said, then I'm ready to go. Now, the impulse that most of us have when we make a phone call, especially important ones, is to call right away. Don't we? I have found that when I take the time to write down a script, to create a script, my success ratio increases immeasurably. I'm using my time more effectively. I'm, in effect, sharpening the axe. You need a system, and you work that system. And at the heart of the system, Three things, a to-do list, a must list, a dream list. A to-do list, write down everything you plan to do in a day. Don't leave anything to just sort of, well, I'll try not to forget that. Write it down. I'll bet you... All of you have to deal with complaints, don't you? You're lucky if you, if you don't, if you get through a day, most people, without somebody complaining. Here is a million dollar question, power phrase, to ask whenever somebody complains. What can I do to make this right? And stop, pause. Or, what can we do to make this right? What does that do? That changes the dynamic from a complaint to a problem-solving exercise. That's where you want to be. Now, the reason that I don't volunteer the solution is that, one, I might offer something they don't want. And can you guess another reason for not volunteering the solution? You might be more generous than you have to be. And so, I ask that question. Now, here are a couple of tips about how you use that question. If it's face-to-face -face and the person is agitated, upset, I recommend saying, could we sit down somewhere? I want, let's talk about it. People tend to be less aggressive when they're sitting down. So could we sit down? So by saying, could I write this down? And then if they're talking in an agitated, rapid way, uh, I'm a slow writer. <laughs> I want to write this down. But let me go to the last. Talked about competence. It's knowledge, it's knowing, showing, attitude, habit. Talked about time management, how important time is. 
getting down to minutes. In fact, I'm thinking of that great poem written by Rudyard Kipling who said, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you and make allowance for their doubting too, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone and so hold on when there's nothing left in you except the will that says to them, hold on. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and all that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. When that poem was written by Rudyard Kipling over a century ago, he had his son John in mind. I'd like to think that if Rudyard Kipling had daughters, as I do, he might have ended it this way. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and all that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a woman, my daughter. But whether you're a daughter or a son, a man or a woman, Great advice worth taking. Fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Last two lessons I've learned from high achievers. Hank Aaron has just broken Babe Ruth's record, his home run record, incidentally, not terribly far from where we're sitting right now. And I'm doing a television interview for Up Close. And I ask him this question, Hank, what separates a superstar from an ordinary player? He pauses. Gene, uh, a superstar concentrates just a little bit more than an ordinary player. I did follow up interviews he told me that he had memorized every pitcher of the National League. That's his word, memorized. By the way, that goes back to that idea of patterns stored in memory, doesn't it? He said, I sometimes dreamed about the pitcher I would face the night before. And then when I would be in the dugout, I'd pull my cap down over my face and I would study the pitcher through the eyelid in the cap. And then, when I'd walk to the batter's box and I would watch the pitcher wind up, I'd know in advance what he was going to throw. And he'd release the ball and it'd be coming toward me, 93, 94 miles an hour. And he said, it would be as big as a watermelon, and I could not miss. Like slow motion, it would be coming toward me. Very strange. I asked the Braves, pretty awful team in those days, did anything like that ever happen to you? And they said, no, it never happened to me. But he said, Willie Mays said it had happened to him. Ted Williams said it had happened to him. Superstars concentrate just a little bit more than ordinary players. Ray Charles, I never wanted to be famous, he said. That's the truth, never wanted to be famous. But I always wanted to be great. He told me about learning how to play in Florida School for the Blind, and I was pretty good. <laughs> I got a chance to audition before a big band leader. Went down to Orlando, and I played my heart out. And when I finished, I expected to hear coming across the room his words, son, you just what we've been looking for. I want you to join us, but instead I heard him say, Son, 
you ain't good enough. What's that, sir? You heard what I said. You ain't got what it takes. And he told me, I went back to my little room and I cried for days. And then I got over feeling sorry for myself. And I began to play again and I would take the same song and play it in every flat key and then in every sharp key so that nobody would ever say to me again, you ain't got what it takes. But if you think this is for big league ball players or legendary musicians, let me tell you about a woman, Mary Kay. Long before I started my cosmetics company, she told me, I went to hear a great speaker speak, and afterwards, I stood in line, it must have been maybe an hour, to shake the great man's hand. And when I got to the front of the line, he did not see me at all. All the time I was shaking hands with him, he was looking over my shoulder to see how many more people were in the line. And I went away hurt and angry, I must admit. But I made a resolve that day that if I ever got to a place like he was, I would not behave that way. And she said, I started playing a game that day. I imagine that every person I meet has a sign around their neck. And on the sign, these words. Make me feel important. And all the time I am talking to them, I'm thinking of that sign and thinking, how can I make you feel important? If you can do that, she said, you're going to be successful in business and you're going to be successful in life. Fast forward. I'm doing a keynote for a convention in Hendersonville. Afterwards, I go over to the exhibition area. Her company has a, a booth, two women. I walk up, I introduce myself. I've interviewed your chairman. One of them says to me, let me tell you about Mary Kay. When Mary Kay takes your hand, she clasps it between both of hers. She looks you straight in the eye. And for that moment, you are the only one in the room. Superstars, concentrate just a little bit more than ordinary players. It's a joy to be with you. Thank you very much.